Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends, mesdames et messieurs. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to welcome to CIC Ottawa branch the Honorable Hugh Siegel, a truly outstanding Canadian. I'm seeing he's ignoring me. <laughs> My name's Randolph Harold, Vice President of your branch, sitting in for Margaret Huber, our president, who is currently at meetings in Washington. Just before I introduce our guest, I want to let you know about our upcoming events. On Tuesday, May 23rd, we will welcome Ambassador Lawrence Cannon, Ambassador of Canada to France, to this venue. Interest in his assessments will doubtless be very high, given the key European national elections taking place including not only those in France in April and May, but also in Germany, September 24th, in Italy before May 23rd, 2018, and now also the SNAP election in the UK. Ambassador Cannon has played a key role in the adoption of the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA, by the European Union. He was, as you know, an influential minister in the Stephen Harper cabinet and served from 2008 to 2011 as Minister of Foreign Affairs. So please mark the date, May 23rd. Uh, the co-chairs of our Asia Pacific Working Group, Alex Goddard, Daniel Koldick, and Martin Lef Martin Laflamme, are honored to confirm that Senator Yen Pao Wu will join us Monday, May 15th at 7 o'clock in the Colonel Bai Room at City Hall for a presentation and con conversation. Many of us will remember Senator Wu as the former CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Senator Wu was appointed last November as an independent, non-affiliated member to the Senate of Canada representing uh, the province of British Columbia. Among his committee assignments are national finance, foreign affairs, and international trade, as well as agriculture and forestry. He's also part of the Canada-US, Canada-China, and Canada-Japan interparliamentary groups. So this coming week, the third meeting of the Middle East Study Group under Hamid Georgiani will take place on Tuesday, April 25th at 7 p.m. in the Richmond Room, again at Ottawa City Hall. Our guest speaker is Mr. Alexis Amini, who will provide a broad analysis of the current and future state of play in the Middle East. Alexis Amini is editor for the Canadian Armed Forces Strategic Program and currently is a graduate student in public and international affairs at the Université de Montréal. He has served in Djibouti and the United Arab Emirates where he witnessed major geopolitical events. And now for our evening with Hugh Siegel, Two Freedoms, Canada's Global Future. Hugh Siegel is Master of Massey College at the University of Toronto, Distinguished Fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs, and Co-Chair of the International Democracy 10 Forum. He served Canada as Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and as a member of the Senate, appointed by the Right Honourable Paul Martin, where he was Chair of the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Trade and of the Special Committee on Anti-Terrorism. He was a faculty member at Queen's University School of Policy Studies and served as president of the Institute for Research on Public Policy. Hugh Siegel is an officer of the Order of Canada and was recently promoted to the Order of Ontario. So you have written a new book about foreign policy. So we might well ask, what ends uh, should a democratic country's foreign policy serve? Avoiding diplomatic disputes, keeping allies happy, promoting national and global security? Well, while a qualified yes is the logical answer to all of these questions, in your new book, Two Freedoms, Canada's Global Future, you argue for something much more, 
something that reflects Canada's commitment at home and abroad to two key freedoms, freedom from want and freedom from fear. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Honourable Hugh Siegel. Thank you for um, that warm introduction, and I want to thank all of you for taking time from your lives to um, spend an evening. I'm a very big fan of the CIC. I remember uh, when I was briefly in its employ, walking into its office in downtown Toronto on King Street West. And in the old boardroom, there was a very old but still well-preserved picture of Robert Borden. And the reason that picture was there was because after his service to the country during the war, in Canada's engagement and massive contribution to the Allied effort in the First World War, he was keen to make it clear to his British cousins that nobody would be signing the Versailles Treaty on our behalf. Canada would attend the meetings on its own behalf and it would affix its own signature or not, as the case might be. And his position was very simple. The sacrifices this country made the young men and the women who served in many other ways paid a price so intense that the right to sign that document belonged to the people of Canada and its duly elected government. And when he left office, he realized that outside what was then the East Block of the Privy Council office, there wasn't a great level of engagement on issues about foreign policy. And that was one of the forces that produced the genesis of what was then called the CIIA, the Canadian Institute for International Affairs. And I remember in my early days working for Bob Stanfield, when the odd red Tory, there were a few of those around in those days actually, <laughs> we had something to protect us other than the game laws, would say that CIIA, you know, you could just take out one eye and it would be an accurate indication of who they are. So there was, always, there was always a fear that if Canadians engaged with foreign policy, it meant they were basically sorting out where to stand in the American frame of the world. And of course, we found out over our history that whether it was uh, the famous election of 1962, where Mr. Diefenbaker, for a whole bunch of reasons, beyond nuclear weapons, was defeated by Mike Pearson, Canada had a different view about the deployment of nuclear weapons in Canada with respect to the Bullmark missiles in North Bay and La Mercaza. And generically, there was more of a sense that Canada could have its own foreign policy, not in opposition to our traditional allies, but in a way that spoke to who we were, what we believed in, and what we could contribute. So I'm always a little angst-ridden in a room like this reflecting on those issues, because I go from table to table and see expert after expert who've had real, what I would call, granular, at the coalface experience on behalf of Her Majesty's Foreign Service in Canada, or on behalf of our armed forces, or in distinguished service in one government or another, ministerial level. So I don't for one minute take the view that because I've written a book on foreign policy, I am here to add a measure of expertise to your collective understanding or individual perceptions. Don't think that would be realistic or fair or even accurate, to be more precise. But I do want to share with you why I wrote the book, how I thought it might be helpful, and where I hope the debate goes as we try to, in these very volatile times, sort through what our foreign policy priorities should be. I start from one premise. The American Armed Forces can have seven different, several different fleets of aircraft because of their size. They can have many foreign policy priorities because of their scope and their scale and their reach. Middle powers like Canada have to make some choices. We don't want to dissipate our resources across too broad a field and have no impact. And I say that with the highest respect for the men and women who have served and continue to serve in our foreign service. When I did various bits of work in the Senate that took me to many countries of the Commonwealth, 
when I was sent as a special envoy to try to talk to the Sri Lankans about human rights, presumption of innocence, things which the civilian Tamil population was not experiencing after nine years after the end of that horrific war. When I would go to countries in Africa and talk about um, gender equity issues and respect for people of different orientations, I didn't presume for one moment that our foreign service wasn't fighting that battle before I got there. They were, but they were constrained by a series of issues. Sometimes they were constrained by a prime minister's office that didn't actually give them the freedom they needed to do the job well, and that is a reality we have to be frank about. But sometimes they were constrained by what I would call the process of multi-level micro-priorities. So, governments change. New governments have their own priorities in foreign policy and in other areas. Nothing bad about that. Ministers change. Every minister has his or her own priorities. Nothing bad about that. And then the priorities sort of build up. They're there. They're, you know, they're different in some cases, mission by mission, but they're there. And by the way, as you all know in this room, they're all chronically underfunded. So it puts our heads of mission in very, very difficult circumstances. And up until changes that were made most recently, unlike other heads of mission for our allies around the world, because of the way CETA operated, good organization, well inspired, did good work, but actually purposefully disconnected from the head of mission in the recipient country. So when, as one high commissioner in Africa said to me, when the Pasha of Sida moved from his office in Paris to hold hearings at the Intercontinental Hotel downtown, my, my commission staff and I could go and we could pour coffee and give out name tags, but everybody in the room who were there to make the case for support from Canada's foreign aid budget knew that I had no influence as the High Commissioner for my country in that part of the world. Now that wasn't anybody's intent. It wasn't anybody's intent in CETA that our colleagues around the world would spend 50 to 60 percent of their foreign aid budget on targeted organizations based on foreign service officers and aid officers in those countries and 80 percent of CETA staff are right across the river at home. CETA didn't make that decision, politicians made that decision. So, it's important that we understand how the lack of, in my judgment, very clear and precise priorities get in the way of effectiveness and efficiency. When 75 years ago, Mr. Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill met Placentia Bay off the coast of Newfoundland and Labrador, in a meeting that they both lied about, Churchill said he was going to visit troops in Africa, 41, and this was before the Japanese had attacked, so Mr. Roosevelt said he was going fishing. He ended up on a very large capital ship for that purpose, and Mr. Churchill, I think, arrived on HMS Prince of Wales, which was a new, new ship just constructed and surrounded by Canadian and other naval air and other assets to keep them safe. And they came up with something which was called the Atlantic Charter. They didn't actually call it that then, it became that over time. And it did not embrace all of the four freedoms that Mr. Roosevelt had enunciated when he got elected after the Depression and began to rebuild America. Freedom from fear, freedom of religion, freedom from want, freedom of the press. They only focused on two freedoms, freedom from want and freedom from fear. And that was the cornerstone that those two great men of history decided was the fundamental building blocks to build the post-Nazi world. And it was on the basis of that framework that the United Nations and its purposes, the famous uh, Charter of the Rights of Human Rights, the Canadians were so intimately involved with, the construction of NATO, the IMF, the World Bank, all of those, in, the, all those institutional frameworks were based on those two freedoms. And in the end, if you think about what happened after the war, the first test they faced was Mr. Stalin's decision that, well, 1945 was 1945, but they needed much more of a buffer zone 
perhaps even through Western Europe, to keep Russia safe after what they had experienced at the hands of the Nazis between 41 and 45, to be fair. So then the decision was, we will have NATO. It will be the freedom from fear. It will be the restraint that will say to the Soviets, don't think you want to become adventurous in the face of all of us, and all of us gets bigger and bigger over time. But they knew they had to deal with the issue of freedom from want because of how crushed and impoverished the peoples of Europe were, which is where the Marshall Plan came along. Billions were invested, not by Americans deciding where they should be spent, but by giving the money to Europeans who would decide how to rebuild their own society out of the rubble that they inherited from World War II. And think about how well they built democracies, industrial economies, social economies, rebirth of all the great historic cultures, musical and other traditions, something which became one of the great powers of the world when it was created as the European community. So the principle in the book and the case that I make is very simply this. For all of us and everybody we know around the world, the things that really matter in your day-to-day -day life are those two freedoms. What does freedom from fear mean in your day-to-day -day life? It means you put your kids in a school bus, you have a real hope they're gonna come home safe. It means you park your bike outside a bike stand and you lock it, you go to work, there's a pretty good chance it'll be there when you come out. It means you can go to work, you can go to a business and not be worried about random violence at the hands of terrorists, the hands of a foreign power, at the hands of local criminals, at the hands of an oppressive state. You take that for granted. We do take that for granted. And a lot of our colleagues in countries not dissimilar from Canada do the same. But in a lot of the world, you can't take that for granted. And the OECD index of the poorest countries in the world tells us those are also the most violent countries. And the UN index of the most violent countries in the world tells us that they are the most poor. And therefore, if we had a foreign policy that used as its two core litmus tests for the money we spent and the initiatives we took and the démarche we launched, what are we doing to advance, protect, or enhance freedom from fear in this target country or that target country? or freedom from want, that struck me as organizational principles that Canadian taxpayers left, right, and center could support and embrace. And more importantly, it would make the mission head's job a little easier than the micro priorities which keep on piling up. Now, let me be clear. It is really important that our head of mission in the Middle Eastern country has the right to decide how to do that and not have that cookie cutter proposition foisted upon him by the PMO or even the Pearson building. Because how you do it in Qatar and how you do it in Istanbul will be very different from how you do it in Beijing or in our consulate in Atlanta. There will be different approaches to take in each one of those circumstances and that's where you want the head of mission to have the freedom to do the work to make sure it's right but it's fundamental that those clear goals and objectives be precise and well-established. Uh, Rosemary Brisson is here, and she worked with me for many years in the Senate, and when I was on my uh, tour of various uh, Commonwealth <laughs> countries as the Special Envoy, I was fortunate enough for her to join along, and we had a, um, an experience in uh, Sri Lanka, which I talk about in some detail in the book. So I was invited to Sri Lanka by their foreign minister, who grew up in the, um, in, the, um, in the High Commission on Range Road. He was a law student. His father was Salon's High Commissioner at the time, and he would come from Oxford uh, for the holidays, and he'd study up in the attic, Range Road. And by all, by, all, by all appearances, a very decent, bright, educated, articulate guy. And because there had been debate in the Senate of Canada about what was happening to the Tamil population, about the disappearances, about uh, the uh, vanning, people being scooped up in vans, 
journalists disappearing um, and all of that, uh, he said, you know, you should come to Sri Lanka and see for yourself. And you'll be able to see anything you want and go anywhere you like, which we did. And you'll remember there was a teeny controversy about the Chogam meeting, Commonwealth Heads of Government in Colombo, and uh, the Prime Minister of Canada I had the honor of serving was of the view that nothing had happened since the uh, war, civil war ended between the Tamil Tigers and um, the majority government to justify celebrating what Sri Lanka was up to at their Chinese built conference center in Colombo. Nothing had happened. And it would be wrong, in fact, to be celebrating that because of what had been happening and what was still happening on an ongoing basis. So I toured around the country under the able leadership of um, High Commissioner Whitman, who was just superb. By the way, they wouldn't, because of Canada's principled stand, they wouldn't accept her credentials for three years. She worked without any discouragement. She was completely indomitable. But so we got there and we did the usual things, meeting with different groups. And we began to realize it was a slightly different frame of reference. When various multicultural, ethnic, and legal, and journalistic groups were invited to the mission, to the residents, uh, to have a working breakfast with the uh, special envoy to the Commonwealth. And um, it was very clear that those who had come and driven were having their licenses taken down by the local police. And um, when, in fact, we then went by aircraft to, to the northern province, to Jaffna, and stayed in a little hotel with the High Commissioner and a small group of Canadians, including the Assistant Deputy Minister for South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, we, um, um, we had some groups who would come and see us, but some groups who were, frankly, too frightened to come and see us. Because while we had been invited by the Sri Lankans and said you can go anywhere, the fact was they had minders on our case every nanosecond we were there. Producing no risk for us, but producing great risk for people who accepted our invitation to come and chat, tell us what they were seeing and what they were doing. And there was one, one evening where we wanted to meet with a committee called the Tamil Reconciliation Council. There was a dean of law, former senior public servants, some students, some members of the clergy, and they indicated that they couldn't come to our hotel. It was just too risky. And that was that cycle where the Sri Lankans had arrested a whole bunch of students who'd been in a protest. And their whereabouts were unknown, causing their parents immense angst. Um, and the term that was euphemistically used was re-education camps. Where have we heard that before? Um, and so there was a wonderful woman, crusty, very competent, and uh, completely fearless who was representing them, who came to our hotel and didn't give a damn about the minders. You know, her response to my question about her well-being was, I'm 75, what are they going to do to me? <laughs> but for this other group, so here, here's the conspiracy. The conspiracy is we send the official Canadian you know, four-wheel drive vehicle with the flags, etc., off to the far end of town to buy pizza. And the high commissioner and I get into a taxi after the minders have gone off, right, to follow the Canadian car, to deepest, darkest urban Jaffna to meet in a private home with this committee of 15 people. I remember driving along and I said to her, I said, Excellency, you know, uh, this may not be the, bro we're following a young man on a motorcycle who's leading us to this. This may not have been the brightest thing we've ever done. And she said, quite remarkably, well, how do you think I feel? If we do get killed, you're going to get first mention. <laughs> but here was the ultimate, and the one that I thought kind of connected with the thematic of this. They have something called the Lakshman Institute, which is a division of their foreign ministry, and they have discussions about foreign policy, and et cetera, and they invite people to come, and I was invited to address that group, and it was a large group one evening. And I gave what would be, every diplomat in the room would see as a very appropriate Canadian diplomatic message. Friendly, 
referencing all the history of Canada and Ceylon, the Colombo plan, nothing was left out. Did you know we gave them 12 locomotives and 10 are still working? I mean, it's, it's wonderful. We brought irrigation and there's a whole foundation set up by Sri Lankans in the name of the Canadian from the University of Guelph who brought the idea of modern irrigation. I mean, all that was in the speech, as you would imagine. And I had a very, very gentle nudge that said something to the effect, you know, because of Ceylon's history as one of the first members of the Commonwealth and its history as a democracy, people will expect more from you. And while the war with the Tamil Tigers was horrific, the Tamil Tigers invented suicide bombing. It was absolutely horrific. The bottom line is you are still occupying the north of the province, the fourth of the country. Sri Lankan men and women and children can't go back to their homes. They are living in shanty towns with the help of the UNHCR. Parenthesis here. Rose and I and the Canadian delegation went to visit some of those shanty towns near Kilinoche. And um, so these are, these are dirt floor huts, sometimes with tin roofs, sometimes with something less, no internal plumbing, and no electricity. Um, and um, we went from house to house, meeting with mostly women, get their views and get their advice on what was going on. And, and their problem was as follows. They were told they could get better housing from the government if they signed away their rights to their existing family land, which had been occupied since the war and which the military was not prepared to. So we go into one house, so we sit and have a cup of tea with the, I'd say these were two sisters living together. I would say Rose in their 50s, maybe. And, um, you know, you have to walk a long distance to get to a well. I mean, nothing was easy. The temperature was very hot. And there is this, this little round of flowers that they clearly had planted, and they were nurturing. And um, the reason, when Rose asked, how do you do this? You don't have any water? You have to walk a day to go to a store to get some food. How do you manage to do this? Their answer is, because it's our home. Because we're going to be proud of where we live and what we do. And by the way, the moment we left in the UNHCR Jeep, the soldiers came in to interrogate them about what we had said and what they had said. And so you're living in this context of intimidation. Let's go back to the Lakshman Institute. After I finish my very gentle speech, one of the minister's crowd puts up this hand. Here's his question. Senator, you haven't fixed your Red Indian problem for a hundred years in Canada. Why do you expect us to have fixed the, the, uh, the Tamil problem in nine? So that's when you have one of these moments where you say to yourself, well, I can do the diplomatic rag the puck, stay away from the truth, or I can reaffirm what an ambassador in Sarajevo once said to me, don't ever aspire to a diplomatic career. <laughs> and I said, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the question. And in Canada, uh, we don't call them Red Indians. They're First Nations. And some years ago, my prime minister stood up and apologized for previous generations of injustice, residential schools. He wasn't involved in any of that, but it was the right thing to do. <clears throat> Three weeks before I arrived in Sri Lanka, they impeached their chief justice, a woman by the name of Bandaranaika. And they impeached her because as the election was proceeding in the province, Jaffna province, and it was clear the Tamil National Party was going to win the provincial government, the Rajapaksa regime and its majority parliament passed a bill, a bill, that took away all the taxation rights from any of the provinces. So that would meant that the new elected government, which is supposed to be a sign of conciliation, would have no money and no authority. That was taken to the Supreme Court. There is quite a substantial legal tradition in that country. And the Supreme Court said it was ultra-virus. 
It's unconstitutional. So they impeached her by a vote of parliament and appointed some a family retainer as the new chief justice. Never been a judge before in his life. So I had a mission from my minister, Mr. Baird, to visit with her, to let her know that Canada thought her, her courage was important, that if she was interested in multiple entry visas to this country, Canada would oblige, and to let her know that we knew how courageous she was. And the message we get through our High Commission is that while she'd be honored to receive the Senator, the arrival of a Canadian government vehicle, flags flying at her residence, would put her whole family at physical risk. So could we find another way to communicate? And in fact, a code was put together, uh, words that would mean different things, so we could talk on the phone to each other, and we spoke while I was in Jaffna by telephone to her down in Colombo. Back to the Latchman Institute, then I said, we call them First Nations. And by the way, we have constitutional protections for our First Nations in our Constitution. They're not perfect. The Canadian settlers' record with the First Nations is not good. We have a lot of hard work to do before we get to anything like fairness and balance. And you know what? Our First Nations have taken governments, provincial and federal, to various courts, and they've won many, many of those cases. And this is where I lost it. And we have yet to impeach any of those judges. <laughs> so the room became a touch electric. My high commissioner said, I need this. <laughs> really, I was managing OK before this guy arrived. The little security guy from the high commission is saying, I got to get him to the car. And I did get a scolding from the foreign minister, but I actually didn't care. Because I think being a Canadian stands for something. And I think that the two freedoms are only relevant if we advance them at home in a way that makes our position abroad legitimate. So therefore, it's not only about the proposition of what we stand for, what we advance, how we shape it, sometimes through trade, sometimes through investment, sometimes through security training, sometimes through education, sometimes through development. The instruments will change, but the purposes should be clear. And it also means that if you're a Canadian political leader who wants to advance these things abroad, you will be held to a very high level of judgment with respect to how well are you doing at home. So if we don't address the abject poverty of our First Nations, who many of whom are living in Third Nation circumstances, proselytizing about poverty abroad is going to sound a little hollow. And um, if we end up on the defense front, Great, great term in Western Canada. Big hat, no cattle. <laughs> Promises, commitments, policy goals, no capacity to deploy meaningfully in any of those contexts. At some point, our friends and allies will understand that and that will just diminish the clarity and impact of our, of our message. Let me wrap up this part by saying three things. I actually give the new government, not of my particular political affiliation, but actually I'm a progressive conservative, so I'm not a member of any organized political party. <laughs> In fact, when, when Kirby and Kaplan and I used to be on Canada AM for that panel, uh, Kirby would say, I'm a member of the Liberal Party, I have serious principles, but if you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> And Kaplan would say, uh, I'm a new Democrat, which means no situation is so bad that government does not have the right to make it worse. <laughs> and I would say, because that program started when the Conservatives were in opposition, I was just a young fellow, um, I would say, look, you cannot trust anybody in government. And then we formed a government. We kept that promise for quite some time. So. <laughs> but, but the truth of the matter is that in the context of what really matters in society, left, right, this party, that party, provincial or federal, in the end, it does come down to the two freedoms. Freedom from fear, 
and freedom from want. And whether it is First Nations women who don't feel safe, many parts of Canada, whether it is people who feel that they are being subjected to unfair discrimination because of their race or their color or their sexual orientation, whether it's about an approach with respect to Canada's capacity to deploy in support of things in which we believe, which we as a country, except in times of war, have been very, very unwilling to support financially. As I say in this room, two prime ministers since World War II have actually spent what was necessary. Louis Saint Laurent and Brian Mulroney, a liberal and a conservative. But every other prime minister who's been in office ever since, liberals and conservatives, have always found a way not quite to step up to that table. And when you want to engage in peacekeeping, you need to have peacekeeping deployable capacity, well-trained. You need to have helicopters that will work in certain parts of the world. If you want to show that you are going to support our allies who are on the ocean facing difficult problems, you might actually have to have a navy. And if you want to be able to deploy in places like Afghanistan or Bosnia, very different missions with very different mandates, you actually have the capacity, you have to have the capacity to do that. And you don't have to become a militarist country and you don't have to be excessively patriotic or unduly nationalistic to say we need the instruments to do the job. The final point I will make is this about the debate about the future of the Foreign Service. So I'm of the view that when Mr. Pitfield was the clerk of the Privy Council, there'll be people in this room who were there and will remember, he took a view about senior public servants which was very, very different from what had been the circumstance in the past. In the past, talk about Ontario, talk about Canada, you did not get to be the Deputy Minister of Natural Resources, province of Ontario, if you had no background in either mining or forestry or fisheries or any of those critical propositions. You did not get to be the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs unless you'd had real experience out in the field as a foreign service officer, doing the hard work necessary so you understood the mix between policy at the top, reality where it matters. You did not get to be the Deputy Minister of Agriculture in Ontario if you hadn't somehow been connected with the University of Guelph <laughs> in your educational process. It's just the way it was. It wasn't a bad thing, it was the notion that maybe the Deputy because we know the minister in our system doesn't necessarily arrive with drill down expertise. He or she may have skills in other places. But the deputy should be the person who is able to steer the important data and information in a way that the minister is fully informed. Um, uh, Mr. Trudeau's clerk of the Privy Council, I've got to say Mr. Trudeau the father now, Clerk of the Privy Council, Mr. Pitfield took the view that actually what were necessary were general managerial skills. You could be a Deputy Minister of Finance and not necessarily be an economist. You could be a Deputy Minister of Agriculture and not have any background in agriculture because you are the person who would find the experts and array the people from within the department. Of course, what came along with that was to set up a parallel process in the Privy Council office to doubly analyze any proposal which came up from the executive committee of any of the ministries. Don't think that was great for morale. Don't think it was great for ensuring that people who were bright and hardworking and had acquired expertise through their own intellectual and experiential background made the progress we all would want to see them make in a, in a constructive government. I think this applies as much to foreign affairs as any other department. There was this notion that we should be having ambassadors who have no experience in foreign policy. 
We, should, we can have senior policy people for whom this is just another policy assignment. They used to be in justice before they were in health. This is all good. Not sure it's good. If you do not have a system that respects the expertise that has been built up over time, guess what? The respect for the system itself is diminished. The question I always used to ask my graduate course at Queen's, why would it be that a border services agent has more broad discretion every day than the deputy minister of national revenue? What would that be about? How do we get to that point in the process? Why is it that an ex-executive officer on one of Her Majesty's smallest naval ships, the MCDV Kingston class, would not get to that post, maybe a crew of 40 to 60, without having gone through a series of training, execution, proving, testing, observance, processes, which certified that person to carry that task. And we don't appear to be making those same demands of some of the most powerful people in the system. Don't get me wrong. I think our deputy ministers are a great group of hardworking, intelligent, competent people. But I think what that does, of course, is say that anybody in short pants in the PMO will know more about what's going on in our uh, mission uh, in Kenya than His Excellency, our High Commissioner to Kenya. Therefore, our, our commissioner in Kenya isn't given the leeway he or she might need to do the job in the way that's going to be most effective. I actually think the proposal that I've made, and I talk about the reorganization of the department and how that might be pursued with respect to the two freedoms would be a very different way of sorting through because under each one of those freedoms, there'd be a different, a very specific drill down skill sets for which real skills and experience would be required. So it's in support of a stronger public service, a Canada that does more globally because we know what we're about and our allies, and if there are any enemies, also know what we're about. And we have a way in which to assess the effectiveness of what we're doing. Because without that, I worry that the disrespect will continue the funding will become even less robust than it is now, and we all know how inadequate it is as we sit here this evening. And that is not in the interest of the kind of, that is not in the interest of Canada is back. Which by the way, every new prime minister has said for the last 30 years, so <laughs> I'm not critical of our new prime minister for going there. It's an appropriate place to be. I'm optimistic that the new foreign minister gets it. Very bright, very articulate, very engaged. No naivety about the Russians. No naivety about Eastern Europe. And I think that is the beginning, if you wish, of some constructive content. Let me end it there, and I'm glad to take any questions or personal attacks you care to share. <laughs>